joining us from off campus. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Terry Jones. I'm a faculty member in the Department of Social Sciences here at Cal Poly. Um, I'm sure that you're already aware of this, but um, our program this evening, of course, is in recognition of Archaeology Month. Let's hear it for Archaeology Month. The month of October, you have one more day to complete you know, your, your festivities, your partying, your recognition of Archaeology Month. Um, so I'm very pleased to be able to introduce our speaker tonight, Dr. Shannon Tushingham, who's been kind enough to travel all the way from Washington State to Cal Poly today. Uh, Dr. Tushingham is a faculty member in the Department of Anthropology at Washington State University. She is also uh, the director of the museum there. And she comes to us with a very distinguished record of scholarly achievement. She got a BA in anthropology. I saw this on her Vita, I couldn't believe it. She received her BA in anthropology from the University of Connecticut in 1991. I mean, I'm figuring she must have been like eight years old, but, then, but anyway, um, she got a master's degree in, anthrop in public anthropology, public anthropology, public archaeology, public archaeology from the University of Tennessee, right, Memphis, and then she completed her educational training at UC Davis. She received a PhD in anthropology in 2009. Um, she has a very, very impressive record of scholarly publication. She's published over 30 papers in the world's leading scientific and archaeological journals. She's published in the Journal of Archaeological Science, American Antiquity, and um, what's the, the, oh, yeah, the little one, Proceedings of the National Academy of Science. Um, she also, believe this or not, as we speak, she has not one but two book monograph, monographs under review at different presses, and I probably shouldn't tempt fate on this one, but she has a paper under review at Nature Communications, which is in the Nature family of, paper, of journals, one of the most prestigious scientific journals in the world. So um, she comes to us with a very significant uh, set of academic accomplishments. So I, I did, though, I have, and she actually has published on a wide variety of topics, and I did want to read to you a couple of titles from some of her most recent papers that are kind of interesting. Um, one of them, this just came out two, this year, the Journal of Archaeological Sciences, Redefining the Age of Tattooing in Western North America, a 2,000-year tattooing tool from Utah. Then another one in 2018, also in the Journal of Archaeological Science, Detection of Nicotine by LCMS Calculus Samples from the Americas. But in another area of scholarship, and also this year in uh, our Journal for North America, American Antiquity, she published a paper, paper, Who Dominates the Discourses of the Past? Gender, Occupational Affiliation, and Matra Vocality in North American Archaeology <coughs> Publishing. Her presentation tonight is Orderly Anarchy, Storage, and the Archaeology of Women's Work in Native California. So I'd like you to... I'd like to ask you to join me in welcoming to the podium Dr. Shannon Tushingham. around um, women's decision making. So um, this has been a fascinating topic for me, um, and I hope that you will be fascinated tonight. I'm hope hoping you'll all be very riveted by this talk. Um, so the three main uh, uh, themes that I'll be talking about tonight are women's decision making um, and leadership, hunter-gatherer storage in Western North America, 
and um, sociopolitical dynamics in California. And it's, it's something that we call orderly anarchy. It's a very interesting um, sort of uh, name for how household production works in much of California. Um, so I want to preface my talk today. I'm an archaeologist, uh, but I also work with a lot of Native American community members. So a lot of my work um, is based in theory. It's based in sort of archaeological training. I do a lot of excavations and study of the human past. But I also work with um, indigenous people, living Native Americans, who have really informed a lot of the stuff that I'm talking about today, tonight. Um, in particular, the importance of women's work in Aboriginal California. Okay, so these are some of the people that I've worked with over the years, um, and that's my son over there, and my daughter up there, um, and that poster or that picture there. Um, my research is centered on hunter-gatherers. Um, I am really interested in, like Dr. Jones, in uh, hunter-gatherers that lived um, throughout the world. I think I'm going to take the show on the road, if that's OK with this, so I can see what's up here. Um, I, I study hunter-gatherers all over the world, but mostly in Western North America. Um, hunter-gatherers are groups that uh, are non-farming people, right? They're ones that um, their, their main mode of subsistence is on collecting plants, hunting uh, different types of animals, and fishing. So they are, they're non-farming communities. And you may have heard the statistics before, but if you look at um, our species as homo sapiens, uh, hunter-gatherers represent about 99% of that human history. So if you think about that, it's kind of mind-blowing in a way, because you know, farming has not been around for that long. Um, and in some places, in, in some very special, special places, there are hunter, living hunter-gatherers um, still around. And anthropologists continue to study them. And archaeologists work with those anthropologists to kind of learn more, to, to, to develop models about how things worked in the past. Um, now, when people think of hunter-gatherers, a lot of times they think of communities like these, right? You've probably heard of, has anybody seen The Gods Must Be Crazy, that movie? Or does that date me? Okay, yeah, that's it, okay, you've seen it, that's good, okay. You can go check it out on Netflix. It's kind of a dated movie about the Kung San, it's a fun one. Um, I think it's one of the reasons I got into anthropology. But generalized foragers, they're mobile people, hunter-gatherers that move from place to place. Um, they have low population densities, so they're groups like um, the Kung Song of the Kalahari Desert in Africa, um, Australian Aborigines, um, you see also the Hadza, um, the Yanomamo or Yanomami from South America. There are still communities um, living today that are what we call generalized foragers. Um, they tend to be um, egalitarian, simple political structure, and um, they have little to no food storage. So they basically move around from place to place. And when resources are available, they go to those places and follow those resources. They don't carry a lot with them. Um, but there are also hunter-gatherers in a lot of places in the world, especially North Western North America, including Western North America, um, who were what we call um, sedentary hunter-gatherers. Um, and uh, you see these communities that are living um, sort of in higher latitudes where it's more seasonal. Um, so you might have, you know, it's, it's not like the equatorial rainforest or anything like that, um, where this, there, there's not many seasons. Um, but places like the Arctic, um, the Northwest Coast, the Plateau, the Great Plains, and a lot of California, um, which are very seasonal, and um, people actually tend to live in quite differently, or live quite differently. Um, a lot of these communities are what we call affluent hunter-gatherers. So um, they're ones that have um, relatively high populations often at contact. Um, they have a productive subsistence economy, so a lot of times they are, they're uh, focused on eating salmon and um, different types of plants. Many of them are sedentary. They live in large houses. Um, like think of the Pacific Northwest Coast. Have you guys ever seen pictures of people living in these large plank houses like this up here? Um, those are hunter-gatherers. Those are not farming people. 
Um, and they, they uh, you know, often um, have a great deal of socio-political complexity, and they live in these um, uh, villages. Um, so it's a very different kind of lifestyle compared to generalized foragers. Um, a lot of study of hunter-gatherers and sort of, you know, when we look at the diversity of different types of uh, different hunter-gatherer lifestyles, um, it really can falsify a lot of myths about uh, what hunter-gatherers are all about. So some of the myths are that, for example, whoops, sorry, hunt, all hunter-gatherers um, are the same. They're definitely not. There's a lot of diversity among hunter-gatherers all, all over the world. Um, uh, that they lived at the whim of their environment. Um, a lot of people have said in the past that, you know, hunter-gatherers, they basically had to, um, they, were, they were drudges, they had to, whenever the seasons were bad, their lifestyles uh, went downhill as well. But in fact, they really were managing the environment in quite unique and, and uh, ingenious ways. Um, and they also falsify the notion that agriculture is the pinnacle of development. Um, Actually, hunter-gatherers lived until contact in most of the West, and they lived very successfully until your own American contact. Um, and this is a very important thing to think about. It's, it, it, it changes kind of how we think about civilization being at the top or the pinnacle um, of, of society. <coughs> Have you guys heard of Lewis Binford before? Dr. Jones talked about Lewis Binford? No, not yet. Okay, so Lewis Binford, he's a, probably the most influential. He, he wrote a paper that's really hard to read, um, but it's a very influential model called the Forager Collector Model. Um, and he wrote this paper in 1980, and he basically noticed that um, hunter-gatherers, if you look at all the hunter-gatherers in the world and how people live, there's, you know, these, there's the mobile generalized hunter-gatherers, and then you have these more sedentary foraging communities who tend to be storing communities. Um, they live in different types of environments, and the ones that are more settled and store food to get through long winters are the ones that live in a higher, at higher latitudes, so like in Northern California and higher, um, uh, up into the Arctic, and these environments tend to be very seasonal. You have to really um, engage with food storage so to get through the winter. So if you don't collect lots of food and bring it back to a central place, um, you're going to have a hard time surviving through the winter time. Um, and archaeologists for um, many, many years have been basically enamored with this idea and have been trying to figure out um, you know, when and why did this uh, transition occur from mobile people to uh, more collector type strategies? So, like, in North America, if you go way back in time, who were the first people that lived in the Americas? Were they, what were they eating? Does anybody, what kind of foods were they eating? Mammoths? Mammoths, right? You think of the Ice Age hunters, they're out there with the atlatls. Have you guys thrown any atlatls in class yet? You've got to take them out there. That's the best part. You get, oh, you, are you going to do it? Because you get to like, sh okay, maybe, yeah. Have, have Dr. Jones bring you, show you how to uh, shoot an atlatl. Um, so uh, early on in the Americas, the earliest peoples were Ice Age hunters and gatherers, right? They're moving across the landscape. They're, they're um, they're, they're uh, for the most part, um, going after these uh, large megafauna. So, um, and then um, after a while as the environment changed, people tended to settle down and they became what we call collectors. Um, and so archaeologists have been trying to figure this out ever since. Um, so I'm somebody that's an evolutionary ecologist and I look at storage in um, lots of different ways. And it's basically a theoretical framework that um, helps you understand how people make decisions about what they, what foods to eat, where to uh, locate themselves on the landscape, and that sort of thing. Um, and it, it's basically, it's based in economic theory, um, and uh, I won't get too much into it, but it's um, kind of an interesting way to think about how um, human beings lived a, a, around the landscape. So storage. Storage is definitely a very complex strategy. Um, it's 
Like I said, it's common in Western North America, and it's really critical to understanding how these groups survived. And the fact is, is that if you think about storage, storage is, it sounds pretty easy, right? Okay, you go out on the landscape, you collect a lot of food, you fish, a lot, you get a lot of fish, you dry them, lay them up for the winter, and then you get through the winter. But if you make the wrong decision, right? If you don't have enough fish, if you don't have enough meat, if you don't have enough plants, your family could die. And think about that for a second. Like literally, your family could die. And, and in the past, we think that people did die. They, did, they picked unsuccessful strategies, and they probably learned from that. And um, they moved on, and then over time, they, they, they tried uh, you know, to be more successful, and those strategies that were more successful uh, became the ones that uh, people pursued, and they, and they continued to pursue. Um, and if you look and if you think about all the different types of storage in Western North America, um, it's really quite interesting because you have um, people that are, um, have you guys ever seen um, uh, footage of the uh, salmon fishing at some of these falls, like Celilo Falls, the salmon fishery, where you have um, Native American fishermen out there collecting um, tons and tons of fish and then processing them, laying them up for the winter in smoke houses and in other ways and, and um, um, putting them in their house for, houses for storage. Um, you have very uh, complex butchery and preparation methods and you also have this interesting um, division of labor where you see, which is important, so generally speaking we see women engage more in collecting plants, um, men engaged more in fishing and hunting, and then women are more engaged with processing the, those foods. And that's, um, you know, generally true for um, most of these societies. Um, the foods that were brought back, so all the fish that was dried, all of the plants that were, that were uh, processed, um, all the meat that was uh, brought home, they were uh, brought back to these um, central places, what we call central places. Um, those are basically the villages. Um, and, and, and sometimes uh, the villages had um, these really large houses where multiple families lived in there. You can see in this um, early engraving, there's, uh, do, you, do you guys can you see what those are right there? What are they doing there? What's hanging from the raft? <coughs> fish, yeah, they're drying fish up there. There's, They've got the families kind of hanging out all around the campfire. Um, and note that there's um, large and small fish. Um, and in these baskets and boxes, here's an example of one of these um, Bentwood storage boxes. These are all filled with, um, with, uh, with food and regalia and precious items that people kept within their houses. And you think about this, this is not the typical picture of a hunter-gatherer, right? It's kind of interesting. Um, so, uh, central place storage was really, really a, a critical part of these societies. Um, people were, it, there's so many really ingenious examples of storage. It wasn't just that people were bringing food back to their home-based villages. They were also caching food um, in these pretty unique ways. So in the plateau, like where I live now in Washington State and Idaho, um, we find, um, we find uh, these caves, these rock shelters. Um, some of them are very cold, um, and they're, they have, they're just lined with ice. Um, and they were basically used like refrigerators, right? So there's this paper here about cold lava tube caves um, that were basically bison freezers. They found bison meat in there and all kinds of things. Um, uh, some of these caves, um, hunter-gatherers used to store. Here there's an account of the Nez Perce um, storing two tons of dried roots in a cave. And um, the federal troops that were chasing them um, in the late 1800s burned them all, which is terrible. But um, uh, I mean, that is a massive amount of food. We're talking about a very large scale of, of storage. Um, sometimes these uh, food caches could be elevated near, uh, this is a, a Yupik. Uh, Alaskan native um, food cache so that was probably filled with all kinds of uh, moose meat and, uh, and fish. And I think it's up high partially to um, keep people away, but what else would it keep away in the Arctic? Bears and 
Bears, yeah, so you think about bears, right? That would be like a very um, sought after, it probably smells really good, you know. Um, so so there, people are really thinking about keeping their, their stores safe. Um, and here's some pie, those, these are filled, these are granaries, these are filled with um, uh, acorns um, that are, are laid up here and ready for um, consumption, for processing and consumption. And some more fish caches from the Northwest Coast. So, so many different examples. California storage was really important too. At Contact, we see um, there's a great deal of linguistic diversity. So this is a map of the state of California. And at Contact, this shows how many different languages um, there were in, Cal in California at Contact. Um, California has um, the highest degree of linguistic diversity anywhere in the world at Contact, um, next to Papua New Guinea. It was just fantastic. Um, and uh, you see um, a lot of diverse cultural groups, but there were some commonalities as well. Um, and, and we know that people were living in California for 14, 16,000 or more years, depending on who you talk to, but for a very, very long time. Um, and these groups are what we call, um, they were hunter-gatherers, and uh, we, they followed a system that was really quite unique among um, peoples in the Northwest. Um, it's what we call orderly anarchy. So that was in the title of my talk, so I feel like I need to talk about it a little bit. Um, but there's this very influential book by Robert Bettinger called Orderly Anarchy, <coughs> Sociopolitical Evolution in Ab Aboriginal California. And um, in a nutshell, he describes the system that worked here, and he basically says that we had really, actually, at contact, Native Americans, um, the, the population densities were quite high. But what's really unusual about California is that you don't see a whole lot of overarching <coughs> political, uh, you don't see chiefs directing everyone. It was very autonomous, and that's what he's talking about with anarchy. Anarchy, he doesn't mean chaos, like people are running around and everybody's you know, going crazy. Um, there was actual order to it, so orderly anarchy, um, but everything was on the family level. So people were, um, very, things were very efficient, the, the populations were high, but you didn't see these overarching political structures where people were saying, you need to do this, you need to do that. Um, they were very uh, autonomous. Um, and, you know, it's kind of an interesting system because it's quite different from like the Northwest Coast. Um, did you guys know that in the Northwest Coast, they had hereditary classes there? They were actual, actually nobles. Um, they had com nobles, commoners, and slaves. Um, those were hereditary classes that people were born into. If you were a, um, a chief in the Northwest Coast, you could direct the other people to do your bidding. Um, it was a much different political structure than in California. So this is, this is a very unique thing. And, um, you know, a lot of us have been interested in, and Terry and I have studied why, why is this so? Why, why has this happened? Um, in California, so there's a lot of foods that were eaten, but the number one um, most important staple was? Acorns. Acorns, right. Um, has anybody eaten any acorn mush? Have you? Did you like it? It was all right, yeah. Okay, what did you put in it? Did you put some salmon in there, or? What? <coughs> okay, so you didn't put any flavoring in there or anything like that? Okay, so it's kind of bland if you just have, oh yeah, it would be sort of like oatmeal without the sort of apple and sugar, or brown sugar, right? Um, it's, I've had it too, I, I feel the same way. But um, acorns were, are really good nutritionally. They're, they're, they're high in carbohydrate, um, they're high in calories, and they're a food that, um, you know, if you think about the landscape, there were lots and lots of oaks, and people could collect the acorns off, of them, um, with, off the oaks, or when, when they fell off the oaks. Um, and uh, if, but they did require quite a bit of um, processing. So this is a, an image of a hoopoe woman who's in the, um, in the middle of um, processing acorns. And so she could collect sort of a basket full of acorns, but um, you would have to um, shell the acorns and then take the nut out of the shell 
Um, and then you have to crush that up in a mortar and pestle. You have to leach them. This is a, this, uh, a leaching basin because there's tannic acids. If you don't leach the tannic acids out of them, you'll basically have a really bad stomach ache. Um, and uh, it, this could basically take all day. So it's what, what we call, it's a, it's a food that we call, you know, it, it has high processing costs. There's a lot of time involved in it. Um, and there's other foods like um, acorns, seeds, and roots that are similar in this way. And um, in California, um, acorns seem to be um, intensified, um, you know, actually thousands of years ago. People have been doing this for a really long time. Some of the earliest, we know this because archaeologists have found um, residues, uh, archaeobotanical residues, so we find um, charred uh, acorn shell in, at archaeological sites. We often find, this is, a, you guys know what this is? Mortar and pestle. Mortar pestle, right? That's for grinding um, the acorns. Um, and then you also find these bedrock mortar sites or milling stations <coughs> in a, in a, at a lot of places. Um, and, uh, you know, we can date these sites and say that they go back, you know, some of the earliest acorn nutshell goes back 8,000 years. And we think people began to really get into acorns or intensify acorns probably by what? What do you think? What's your guess? Four or five thousand years ago, something like that? Um, oh, and by the way, if anybody wants to have some cocktail party um, language here, philanophagy is the, um, is, is, uh, acorn eating. So if you're someone that likes to, is into melanophagy, that means that you like to eat acorns. So that's you and me. <laughs> um, and what's really um, interesting about this is that, okay, who's doing the processing of the acorns? The women, right. So there's that division, that general division of labor. Um, women did, um, they were the ones that were um, doing all the pounding, the shelling, and all that stuff. And, and we know intensification of acorns was really important because what happens is when people start to intensify and rely on acorns, that's when people start to settle down. Um, we see more sedentism and storage and hunter, among hunter-gatherers. And we really think this is important, so we want to track this. Um, and um, common, common notions among archaeologists is that um, you know, women bore the, the brunt of uh, of of, uh, of plant intensification. Um, in some accounts, some early ethnohistoric accounts, they talk about um, you know the uh, Euro American settlers would come and, and they observe Native American women um, engaged in this kind of processing, and they said they worked like slaves. It was such hard work, and they worked all day. Um, and they, and they highlight the drudgery of this work. And there's no there's no doubt that it was hard work. Uh, but this is, this is kind of an interesting thing. Um, and, you know, a lot of archaeologists have talked about this as um, women's labor was really the path to a man's wealth. Um, what we see in the archaeological literature is basically, um, you know, what I'm trying to improve is the notion that we should think a little bit harder about why women were doing what they were doing. We spend a lot of time talking about the decision making of of men. So there's um, archaeologists that talk about um, why <coughs> men hunt in the places they hunt, why they choose the tools that they, they um, hunt with or fish with. Um, and they talk about women's work or plant processing as something that underwrote um, men's activities. And this is something that you'll see in the literature again and again. Um, and, and that this was so men could engage in prestige hunting. Um, and so what I think this sounds like is kind of like women are the white noise in archaeology. They're sort of like, there's this, there's this um, assumption that plant processing is really important. We know that it was plants, acorns, and, uh, and other plants um, uh, took up about 60% of the diet or more. Um, but you know, we should be looking at that a little bit more closely. Um, and more and more archaeologists are kind of looking at the evolutionary archaeology of leadership and the role of women. Um, and there is a, basically a, an overemphasis on overarching political structures. This is one paper that talks about political leadership and how anthropologists have been focused on 
sort of, you know, the, the higher level um, leadership, but not what's going on within the household. And if you really look at what's going on in the family, uh, women are active, a greater proportion of women than men might actually occupy leadership roles, which is kind of a, a new way of thinking about things. So how did women influence the development of storage-based communities in North America? Um, and my answer to that is quite profoundly, and I, and I think that we need to think a little bit more about how this, uh, how this worked. Um, households were the main unit, unit of production, um, and you see people are making decisions about what to store on that level. And women are very much part of those decisions. Um, they, they directed many, many aspects of household production. Um, it's very clear that women are what I would call the keepers of the store. Remember what I was saying about like if you don't have enough uh, meat or fish to get you through the winter, your family can die. People were really keeping track of what they had in their stores. Um, and uh, women were often engaged with this. And I'm not saying that men weren't as well, but, but women were very much part of this. Um, they directed decisions about gathered and hunted resources. So if there weren't, you know, if there wasn't enough meat to get people through, they would um, ask their husbands to go get some, go get a, go get me a deer and bring it back, and, and we'll uh, we'll fill up the larder with that. Um, they they controlled and often owned processed foods, plants, meat, and fish, and um, they also were responsible for constructing storage containers, like they were the ones that made the baskets and everything that the food was contained in. So they really played a critical role in storage. Um, in Northern California, Northwestern California, have you guys ever been up to like Humboldt County, Del Norte County? Yep, it's a great place, right? Um, if you go up there, people, this is a unique part of California, that's where I did my dissertation work research. Um, people lived um, they, were Cal it was Cal they were California societies, but they lived in these um, plank houses that looked very much like the Northwest Coast. But what's different about these is that this is the only place where men and women lived in different types of houses. Um, so you have a family house where the women and children lived, and a sweat house where the men, men lived. But all the food stores were kept inside of women's houses. They were really keeping track of what was in there. You can see this is the inside of a house, and it's, you can't see it very well, but around, uh, around the fire, there's, there's baskets that are, that are filled with um, all kinds of food. Um, and in these places, women had a very high status, actually. You had uh, individual women um, owned property. They had their own use rights. There were fe female shaman, female doctors. Um, and they had systems called half marriage. Um, and a half-married one is basically where a woman will take a husband who doesn't have enough money for a dowry, right? And so they're, they're regarded as being half-married. Um, and uh, this is Lucy Thompson, she's a Yurok woman, and she wrote about this um, in 1916. And by this marriage, she wrote that by this marriage, she's the absolute boss of the man and has complete control of all the children. She has the power to correct her husband in all his actions and can send him out to hunt fish or work just this she deems proper. So in those, in those types of um, marriages, uh, women did have a lot of power. Um, a lot of this kind of information is lost because, um, you know, we didn't always record those things. Um, early ethnographers did not always record those things. Um, you also see in this uh, region a system called sororal polygyny. So what does that mean? What does sororal polygyny mean? Yes? Okay, so what does the sororal part mean? Sisters, right. So you're marrying sisters, more than one. Yes, exactly. So multiple wives who happen to be sisters. And you see in the ethnography, so these early ethnohistoric writings, that um, the men said that they preferred the sisters as wives because they didn't fight. So, but what about the women? And 
there's a lot of reasons why women would prefer that. I mean, I can't imagine being married with my sister personally, but you can. See, but a lot of times it would be advantageous to be married to your sister because she's somebody that you know. There's somebody that's looking out for you. She's not a stranger in your household, um, and there's um, quite a bit of uh, you know power in that. Um, and Bob Bettinger talks about, you know, women being active agents in, in social relations. So they, they were really um, important in these communities. So this is a, you guys probably have never seen this, but do you guys know Woody Allen? I'm, I'm not a fan of Woody Allen, but I mean, I know he makes good movies, but he said this, in my house I am the boss and my wife is the decision makers. And that just basically says that, you know, you have this kind of dualism. So people, there's a lot going on. So on the outskirt, outside, you might have somebody looking like the boss, but there's a lot of decisions that are be being made um, on the inside of the house. Division of labor. Now, we're making a lot of assumptions about the division of labor, right? Hunters and gatherers, and we know that probably gender was a lot more fluid in the past. But we do think that, for the most part, a lot of these activities, you know, there were certain activities that tended to be more uh, pursued by men versus women. <coughs> Um, now, evolutionary anthropology, so some of the work that I do, it really helps to explain why some of these deci decisions are made. Sometimes it can help us understand why weird things happen in the past. Basically, that's the only way I can put it. So sometimes you'll see, you know, you'll say, well, acorns, why would people intensify acorns? Because there's so much work involved in acorn processing. We know that it takes you all day. There's other plants and foods that you could focus on that would be a lot easier to pursue. Um, so we sort of, as archaeologists, we think about that and sort of why, what's the logic here? What's, what's the economic logic? And maybe there's things going on here. Um, and so we think that evolutionary anthropology tells us that women's, women's decisions probably were influenced by childcare and provisioning um, and family responsibility. So they, they're engaged, they're making decisions that are wrapped around how they can bring their children to the places where they're gathering food um, and, and uh, processing food. And so that's going to influence uh, settlement patterns. It's going to in influence the, the different types of foods that people eat. It's going to influence all kinds of things. So it's not a wonderful picture of the baby in the baby basket. Looks like a, like a three-year-old in there too. So, um, you know, that's, it's, and, and, and what we're seeing is archaeologists are looking at this a little more and more, looking at the costs and benefits uh, for women, um, and, and uh, what are the strategic advantages to plant intensification? Why work harder? Is, it, is this all about drudgery? Was it, were there any advantages about, um, about uh, acorn processing and the like? And what if, you know, one way to think about this is, um, uh, from the work of Lillian Ackerman. She talks about, um, in, in the plateau, for example, um, again, a lot of the early missionaries, they would see women processing fish, processing acorns and, and roots, and they said they worked like slaves, they're working so hard. Um, but Lillian Ackerman, who worked with plateau Amer uh, Native American groups, um, a lot of them told her, you know, we work hard, but the stuff that we process and we store in our houses belongs to us. And we can do what we want with that stuff. So, so there is an advantage, even though it's a lot of work, it brings quite a bit of autonomy. So uh, once a woman put her labor into preparing all this food, um, it belonged to her. She made decisions on its use autonomously. People weren't going to take it away from her. Um, and in this, these places, when you have a lot of, um, you know, uh, women are contributing a lot to these societies. Um, the genders are equally valued. Um, and, and women really uh, were making decisions about how and when these foods were um, used. Um, so it can relate to status and power if women are contributing a lot to um, the economy. Um, there's absolutely no doubt about this. So women, women played a critical role in hunter-gatherer societies. Uh, they, they filled important leadership roles. Uh, they were independent property owners. They were key players in household production. And they were also key drivers in this orderly anarchy system. Um, 
this is really important and something that a lot of um, people are starting to look at, and um, there's a lot of interesting <coughs> work going on. So with that, I will say thank you very much. Thanks, Terry, for the invitation, and to Cal Poly uh, for uh, supporting this visit. Um, Tolo community, Bob Bettinger, Lillian Ackerman, and my students and, and uh, fellow faculty members in Washington State. <laughs> quite a bit of time for Q&A, and I did that on purpose. So, if I have any questions? Yes? How do you date a bedrock mortar? Good question. So if there's residue, sometimes if you have charcoal residue that's in the bedrock mortar, or you have archaeological um, like midden uh, next to the bedrock mortar, you can um, you can date that. You can't so you can't date the stone itself, obviously, but you do the best you can by uh, dating the um, associated materials. Sometimes you might have like. Um, you know, radiocarbon dating is the best way to go for it. Sometimes you might also find index, what we call index fossils or, or certain types of artifacts that we know date to um, certain times in history. So if we find like, uh, you know, a certain point style, we know it's about 5,000 years old, that sort of thing. So, yes? Was this sort of order of the anywhere else in the world? Oh, good question. So I think, to my knowledge, in Western North America, yes. I would argue that, although Bettinger makes this argument just for California and parts of the Great Basin, um, I think you see it in the plateau. So Washington, Wyoming, Wyoming Idaho, Montana, that area. Um, outside, can you think of any other place? It's highly unusual, yeah. And the fact is, is that a lot of hunter-gatherers died out of contact, so we don't know, you know, this area we have a really good record of um, what was going on at contact. So, yeah, good question. It, we might recognize it archaeologically, though, in other cases. Yes? I can't think of any, but there were definitely people within societies, you would see this quite a bit, where you know they would take on um, the gender roles of the other biological sex. So you would often see, like bird ashes, if you've heard of bird ashes, so there would be men that would dress as women. Um, uh, and so there was a lot of fluidity within these societies. So even though I'm talking about this like very rigid, I don't I don't want to portray this, the division of labor as too rigid because actually in American Indian, a lot of um, traditional societies, it was actually quite fluid. So I can't think of any cases where it was completely flipped on a society basis, but within societies there were individuals, and it was yeah, and it's yeah, good question. Yes. Why were they called sweat houses? Why were they called sweat houses? Good. What do you think? Yeah, they were hot, and they sweat. Okay, so sweat houses are really cool. Um, I found a, uh, I excavated a sweat house in northwestern California. Um, basically, it was a place. Um, sweat houses are very common. They were all all throughout the Americas. Um, they were places where uh, men usually, women also had sweat houses, but men would gather and um, they would purify themselves through heat. Um, and in California and a lot of places in the West, it was not through steam, it was, you know, you go to a, like a sauna, sort of to put the water in there, like get this, the steam bath and everything like that. It was, it was a, 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 a house that would um, have a fire inside of it, get very hot, and it was a, a way of uh, purifying um, yourself. So people would often have a sweat every day before hunting, before a religious ceremony, it was part of a religious rite. So it was, it was not just a, a physical thing, it was a part of, of the religion as well. And often, like in Northwestern California, what they would do is people, men would exercise, and uh, they, they'd have a sweat, and then um, they would uh, run down into the cold water, and you know, that would be their purification. So, yeah. Yes? 
It would be, I think it would be more family focused. And I should preface that by saying that was that slide was with the, about Plateau Native Americans. And so we do know we have really good documentary evidence that in the Plateau, like on the Columbia River, um, in that region, women were, um, they, would, um, they would use their surplus for trading with other people um, for all kinds of goods. Like they would go to these, um, Salilo Falls was a, 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 a center for fishing. It was a place where people would um, uh, gather to, uh, to um, harvest massive amounts of salmon. But it was also a place for people to come together and trade um, obsidian, baskets, to find marriage partners, and also to, um, you know, sort of barter and trade. Um, and there's evidence, I, and I, when I was started to research this, um, Lewis and Clark, when they first came through the Columbia River, were actually um, women, they would not talk to the women. The women were the ones that were trying to negotiate with these white settlers and, and with Lewis and Clark. And this just like, the white guys, they were just like, what? You know, the, we don't only talk to men. So, uh, so those roles changed uh, pretty early in time, as known historically, in, in the Plateau region, which is kind of interesting. So um, you can see where uh, historic things can change uh, the role of women and their status pretty quickly. Yes? Was it common among the guys that No, it was not common. That's a really good question. It's that, that pattern in um, Northwestern California where you have the men living in the sweat houses and the women living in family houses, women and children. You, you see it, the, there's the Yupik um, uh, in Alaska have a similar pattern and there's some Hawaiian groups that have a similar pattern, but it's very unusual to have that. You would see among many California groups, um, like you would have a men's, you'd have the family house, but you'd also have some people with the nuclear family, and maybe grandma and grandpa would live there too, or nearby. Um, and then you'd have like a men's house, or the, a, a, like a gathering place, or a, a women's place, women's gathering place, but not like this. It's, that was pretty unusual. Yes? Yeah. Yeah, there's a um, good question. There's, we have, um, I have BA students that help me in my lab. Um, we also have uh, master's and PhD students. So students come and they apply to work on different projects. Uh, if you wanna come to Washington State, it's a good place to be. Um, and uh, a lot of them are engaged in laboratory work um, as well as field work too. So they're, they're part of my research for sure, yeah. Yes? Oh, that's a good question. I might have to think about that one. That's a really good question. Um, among Native American groups today, I can tell you, I'll think this through, I can tell you one thing. The Native American women that I've talked to, um, when you tell them about like, you know, how men were the bosses and all this stuff, they're like, what, you know? And I think, and if you talk to Native American women, they're very strong. There's, they're, they're you know, they're, they're leaders in, in today. And, and, and that does have, um, I, and I think there's, a, there's definitely a connection to the past there. Um, orderly anarchy, what do you think, Terry? I'm trying to think. Autonomy, so the, I'd have to think about that for a little bit. I, I know, maybe in contrast, if you, if you work in the Northwest Coast, um, in the Northwest Coast, remember I was saying there were, there were, um, there were nobles, there were people that were born, born into nobility. These were the ones, these were the people who were more wealthy and they, and they had um, hereditary rights. Even today, if you're in the Northwest Coast, 
People will say, I'm from that family. I'm, I, I have this, I'm from a noble family. People don't usually say I was from, you know, I was a slave or a commoner or something along those lines. And so there are those connections. But orderly anarchy, I'm not sure. I'd have, in California. It's a good, really good question. Any more questions? Yes? I was wondering, um, first of all, really great talk. Very, very good. Thanks. Um, so I was thinking about what you were talking about, how busy they are during the season and which they're doing all this. And I'm wondering, which can you characterize the day and what can you do about the process you might look Yeah. So, yeah, the seasons. People were going by the seasons. So um, you think about, um, well, that would be downtime, right? Because people in the spring, they're, uh, they're going, they're gathering plants. Um, you have to go in the summer and fall to uh, get your fish and lay everything up for the winter time. And actually, in the winter, people were mostly in their home bases, hanging out. But that was a time for um, making baskets, for mending nets, and working on tools, um, and it was really a big time for ceremonies as well. So, you know, people were very local. They were living, uh, you know, in some of the colder places, like in Northern California and higher up. They're they're really centered in their house or around the fire. Um, and was that? It's and it's raining out. Yeah, you're on the coast. It's like really wet out. So you want to be in that cozy house. Um, but it's a time. That's a time for um, certain ceremonies, and um, and kind of getting ready for the new year. Uh, world renewal ceremonies are really um, quite common in California, or first fruit ceremonies, and you see a lot of that happening in the fall as well. So, sort of the Native American New Year, basically. Questions? Yes. Um, you said something about uh, child care and family responsibility influencing uh, women's yeah. decisions and like that influencing settlement patterns. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering like what that would look like. So that's something that, yeah, I glossed over that pretty quickly. Um, that's something that, uh, I'm starting an archaeological field school in Washington State this year and um, with um, uh, a tribal community, the Colville Tribe, and we're looking at how women made decisions, or how people made decisions about where they were located on the landscape. And um, we have basically built up what we call a field processing model. Let me see, I don't know how much I want to explain. Do you want to hear about it? <laughs> you sure? <laughs> um, so basically, the idea is that um, people are going to, with, with uh, child care opportunity costs, the idea here is that. Um, you're, you're going to have an, uh, you have to make a decision. When you have to go and forage or, or go to a location, move somewhere or do something, you're going to take in, um, you're going to weigh um, the, uh, the loss of, um, you're, going to, you're going to weigh uh, how much that's going to take away from caring for, you, for your children. So that's going to be a concern to you about where you go on the landscape. Um, in the plateau, we think that people were, um, making decisions about how far they would um, go to process roots um, over the landscape, and um, that, and we've built a model. Um, it's called a fill processing model that predicts that people that the transport distances should actually be um, uh, would have to be very close for it to make any sense. Um, but because of childcare processing. Uh, childcare uh, provisioning, we think that women were um, either making the decision to uh, bring uh, the roots back to the home base village or to very distant road camps and that the entire family would go with them. So rather than just going to, uh, to the root camp, the distant root, play, uh, root grounds, um, that they would bring their entire family up there. And we should see, see that on the landscape. So um, it is um, I'm really excited to investigate that. And that's something that we're working with the, the Colville tribal members who still process roots, um, and uh, they're helping us um, understand how people made decisions about where to go and how far they would go, too. So that, that's a critical piece of it, and how far they would carry 
um, their children. Like if you think about carrying a baby and having to transport roots back as well um, and a heavy load, that really does make a difference about uh, where you're going to locate yourself on the landscape. So, yes. Oh, good question. Okay, so caching is really interesting. Um, so we think there's all kinds of... There, there, so central place storage is... Um, is uh, um, central place storage is basically one type of storage where you're going to a distant camp, right? So you're going to go and um, hunt or fish or gather, and then you're going to bring all that food back to your central place. And so that's your village and your house. Um, but caching can be a little more what we call logistical and or strategic. Sometimes when you have to travel a really far distance, like those root ground, grounds, I didn't really explain that very well, but if you have to go to those root grounds and they're very far away, you might think, well, instead of bringing all that load back, what we're going to do is temporarily cache them in a certain place. And it can be a very strategic means of, um, of uh, saving resources um, uh, for the future. So caching can be um, very, uh, very uh, low impact, you, you know, sort of, if you don't go back to that store, it's not a big deal. Um, or, uh, and it's not a heavy investment, I guess is what I'm saying. You don't have to pay the cost to bring everything back. Um, so, like when you see those, um, you know, the storage caves, some of those storage caves in the plateau are like in the middle of nowhere. They are out there, and what we we but they're they are close to root gathering grounds that are also quite distant from villages. So we think that people were strategizing, and instead of going to those root grounds and trying to bring everything back, they were kind of caching them in these in these distant places. Um, as insurance, and they would go back there to those places when they needed them. So it's all—it's very strategic thinking about how you're you're going to use the landscape, um, and uh, yeah, a lot of a lot of thought went into it. So, yes. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of, I mean, just in terms of, like, um, uh, you mean other than, like, subsistence, like, fishing and yeah. religious life, um, there, were, there, were, there were a lot of divisions in that respect, yeah. Um, I don't know, what else can we think of here, Terry? Many, many, yeah. Different, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, yeah, I mean, I would say also, you know, it's interesting because in a lot of places, women would own the rights to certain parts of even fishing, right? So, like, um, constructing a weir, we think about, like, fishing as a men's activity, but there were certain parts of constructing a weir that a woman owned. Or the ground. Like they, they had to, they owned the rights and the knowledge behind these specific types of lashing. And so it was a very symbiotic thing. So the men could, did some things, but if they didn't have those lashings, um, the lashings like for connecting all of the, the wood um, stakes that made the weir, um, then they couldn't make the weir. It was sort of a very, you know, they had to work hand in hand together. But it's very interesting that you know, this is something that they would not share with men, at, um, and vice versa. So there, there were lots of rules like that. You see, that's pretty common. Any more questions? Yes. Uh, how uh, has it worked? Oh, great question. Yeah. So children, actually, the archaeology of children. If anybody wants to come study the archaeology of children with me, please come to Washington State because that's a big part of this too. Um, children 
children were doing all kinds of things. They were really engaged in subsistence. They were out there. It's not like they were just sitting around. They were out there with their mothers and fathers um, and learning how to hunt and gather and participating um, a, a great deal. Um, most of the groups that I know of, uh, boys were with the mothers until a certain age. Um, in Northwestern California, it would be until they reached puberty. And actually, like they would, the boys until about you know puberty, they would live with the mothers, and then they would, then they would go live in the dad's house, which I guess would be like kind of a hard, you know, a bit of both. Um, but but children were very very engaged, and and uh, you know, and they talk about um, you know how how children. Uh, contributed to society and also how they uh, learned how to master things like um, bow and arrow hunting. Like that's a very, you know, that's a great skill. Boys were learning how to uh, use a bow and arrow from when they were little, little, you know, and, and when they were little, they were, um, they might not have been going after elk or deer, but they were, um, you know, they were shooting uh, small animals and bringing them home and that sort of thing. So they were, they were big contributors to the diet. Um, and you would, but, but when girls would be with their mothers doing the processing um, as they got older and taking on those roles and vice versa. So um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a, that's a, the, the archeology span of children is really an interesting thing. And, and older people too, people forget about elders and what they were doing in, in these societies as well. Any more questions? Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, how would marriage occur? Do you know, find out, like, you know, like, the girl still is mother until they were married off? Or was it also, like, a status point in the country? Like, men had to bring home a certain amount before they could actually get married or something? It, it varied. It varied from community to community. So, um, in Northern California, yeah, it, you would have, um, men would have to um, pay, um, a, a, a dowry basically to enter into a marriage and if they didn't have enough items to contribute then um, they couldn't get married. They'd have to enter into that half marriage and sort of work it off so they would live with um, the wife and her family rather than the wife going to live with his family and so there were all sorts of rules like that. Um, divorce too was basically as simple as women could just walk away. They could divorce. They weren't beholden in a lot of these societies um, which is kind of an important thing, you know, um, people could just sort of, you know, walk away and it was as easy as that. Um, and so, uh, but there was, there was variability for sure, um, but it's qu quite interesting. Yes. Any more questions? I think I saw a hand. No? Okay, thank you.